he got me wired for sound here now. Uh, <coughs> I'm Tom Ivester, an alcoholic. Uh, I'm a member of the primary purpose group in uh, Southern Pines, North Carolina. <coughs> yeah, I think I'm about to lose my voice. I'd be totally disabled if I do that. Who did it, Peter? I mean, Sorry, who did it? God, you'd think he'd sober up by now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's good to be back, uh, be, be back up in this little piece of Vancouver, and uh, typically good weather. I told him, I said, I'm going to wear rain gear the whole weekend because I looked at the computer and said, this place is going to look awful. And it's beautiful. It's just absolutely beautiful. And you guys look, well... <laughs> now, not beautiful now, but you're looking better than you did, I bet you. Thank God. And it's good to see everybody. We'll be, uh, we'll be here till noon Sunday, and uh, God only knows what we'll do. The, uh, uh, I don't have any real, really, really hard outline. I'm not somebody who has canned stuff. I have a lot of notes here, but I don't know where they came from. I just sort of pick up stuff. And bring it with me so I'm not lonely on the airplane. And it is good to be here, good to be back. Thoroughly appreciated when I've been here before. And, uh, and, and think we will this time as well. Um, i tell, tell you what I, what I would, would like to do is, uh, number one, I really like for things to be interactive. And what I mean by that is two-way communication. Uh, I learned a, long ago, it was, in, it was in a college speech class. A guy, a guy said something that I've never forgotten and I've believed it ever since. Is that when you look at what makes communication effective, simple little stuff that, you, that I've never had really thought of. And, and what he said was, when you do one-way one communication, like a lecture or a speech, that... At the end of two weeks, you'll be lucky to remember 2% of it, 2%. That it just isn't an effective way to communicate. And then if you get, if you get involved in the presentation, it'll go up to 35 or 40%. And then if you, uh, if you uh, get involved in putting it together and putting it out, it'll go well over 80%. So I like interactive because I just think it's a lot more effective. And I think it's more useful. And, and so what I mean by that is I'd like for us to just sort of sort of talk with each other as we go along here through the week. Now, if you if you just leave it up to me, I'll do it. <laughs> but you may not like it. It'd be, but it, it'll, I'll, I'll fill it up. You can count on that. Uh, but I'd much much rather it, it be something that's going to going to fall into to where you are, where you what you what you're thinking is about right now. And uh, what what I what I basically would would like to get done some a little bit of tonight would be to one I'm going to let you know who I am. You know, you know, the, the, the strange thing about about uh, speakers and alcoholics anonymous, you you probably have noticed this. If somebody gets up to speak to an AA group and they don't do what we call qualify, we don't listen to them. If somebody just starts making a speech to a group of AA members, that's an exercise in futility because the screen will just drop. You don't listen to theories and, and, and all this kind of stuff. You, what, 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 what really works for us is, is identification. And uh, <clears throat> that's the reason we do what we do. I tell you the worst, <laughs> I, I think probably the worst time I have ever had trying to get going in, in making an AA talk in, in a group. A guy, he's an old attorney. Well, somebody said to him, going through a cemetery and saw a, a gravestone of an attorney there in that town said, here lies a, 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 an honest, an honest, I forgot what they said. They, <laughs> they, 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 oh, they said an attorney and an honest man. And the guy that was looking said, my God, they're burying them two to a grave. <laughs> so, uh, 
I had an attorney like that that had invited me to speak in Charlotte, our biggest town. And he had gotten hold of my professional resume somewhere. And he introduced me with a resume. Yeah, where he went to school, where he worked, all this kind of stuff. And I swear to God, I was just wanting to sink under the chair. And uh, it took at least 15 minutes to start communication. Because it just puts a wall between folk. That's not what we're about. We're about people who share experience. And uh, I honestly believe the purest form of Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought you were coming at me, I guess. <laughs> you never know about Canadians. I married one. I know how, I know how they behave. <laughs> she. But the purest form of, of communication, of, of the purest form of AA meeting, is when somebody does exactly that. We share the experience, strength, and hope, where they were broken and healed. And I, you know, what I base that on is uh, somewhere, people know what page is on, at the end of, of, of Bob's story, when he's writing for the big book. Yeah, what is that, people? It's one, 80 to 100. Around the land of Bob's story, That's right. A man knows every word in the book, ignores at least half of them. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he knows them. But it's that, it's that page right before the last page of Bob's story. And he put a little paragraph in there that I think has a lot of, a lot of meaning about a lot of things. And he basically, what he basically said, my words, pretty close to his, but not exactly, that... He's talking about his meeting when he and uh, and, uh, and and Bill Wilson met in that uh, that Cyberling estate at the gatehouse, and most of you've heard of that. You know that it was actually the birth of Alcoholics Anonymous that, that happened that day. Nobody announced it, but that's when it really happened. And Bob, the busy physician, Bill was the sober guy. He was the guy that was trying to get AA going. He was trying to work with other alcoholics because he found out that helped him. And, and, and in his desperation in Akron, Ohio, he put out a plea for somebody to, to, to get him an alcoholic to work with, and somebody gave him Dr. Bob. And so him and Bob had this meeting at the Cyberling Gatehouse at their, at their mansion. And if, you, if you haven't been to Akron, you get a chance to go, by all means, take a look, because it's just like walking into our history, and it's very easy to visualize what happened that night. And, and what happened, they, they met over there... Bob said he didn't have much time. He only had about 15 minutes, and about six hours later, they quit. And later on, Bob said, and, he, and it's the way he said it in, in what he wrote in the book, what was it about this man? You know, here's a learned physician, a highly trained scientist, and he's, here's a guy that's marveling. What was it about this guy, a broken-down, decrepit stockbroker from New York, that was different than all the other people with whom I talked. And then he answered his own question. And he said essentially this, that he was the first person I had ever spoken with who talked in terms of his own experience. He didn't try to teach him anything. He didn't try to explain theories of the illness or any of the science or causation. He talked about his own experience. It said, he talked my language. And that really set the basic, what I think is the basic tenet of Alcoholics Anonymous is what, you know, we're a diverse bunch of people here tonight. But there's one thing that makes us all one. And that's the fact that we were all broken and healed at the same place. And that has no respect for our differences. That's the thing that, that gives us commonality. And so that, that's what's important about that thing of... Uh, of sharing our experience instead of our ideas and philosophy and knowledge that we have. It's about sharing that experience of what it's like to be broken and healed. And uh, so it's been part and parcel of our, uh, of our fellowship. I also think, uh, just, just allude to this, and we'll talk about it later if you want to, but I also think it's the, the fundamental reason why singleness of purpose is such an important thing. That, yeah, that, if you don't have singleness of purpose so that people can have that, that available opportunity 
to identify, then what we've done is abdicated on our responsibility to pass it on to the next one. And so I think it's the basic tenet that no matter how much we may sympathize with each other, if when we identify, it's at the level of how we were broken and how we were healed, you know, and therefore makes it strong. So anyway, a lot of growth, a lot of stuff grows out of that. But but let, let me tell you, I, I, I'll tell you <coughs> some version of of my experience, and then be thinking. If 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 I'm not saying anything that just lights your life up, be thinking in the little time that you might have available about things you would like to, 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 to get in discussion about here this weekend. You know, we're going to be spending some time here up on a, it's not a mountain, is it? It's a, a little hill. <laughs> no, a hill. We, we're, up, we're up here. I don't want to fall off, off of it if you can. Uh, but we're up here a little ways, and it was sitting by a beautiful lake. We've got a lot of time. No phones are ringing much, and we got a little time. And, and what I'd like to see us do is to make this time worthwhile. Use it, you know, to get things done that we want to get done. And so be thinking about things that, and toward the end of the session, uh, we'll just ask you to call it out. You know, some, anything that you would like to see that we covered this weekend, uh, just bring it up and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll wade into it. And I don't mean just me. You know, I don't want to be the expert answer man. But I'll take a shot at it and, uh, and then invite, invite you to do the same. It won't make a discussion meeting out of it, but make it an interactive session. You know, so that if you've got something, raise it up. You'll probably be speaking on behalf of 80% of the group. And so anyway, that's what, what I'd like to get done a little bit tonight. Uh, yeah, I'm a guy, I'll give you a kind of a, a little bit of a scaled down version, but, but the, uh, the story is basically the same. It just comes out a lot different. Yeah, I walked into my first AA meeting on the second day of February in 1957 at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I don't believe I have ever felt more out of place anywhere in my life than I did in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I was 24 years old. This was 1957. And AA was just coming out of the shadows in 1957. It was not well known. There were just a, a select few people around the country that were aware of AA. And uh, so it was, a, it was sort of a, a bur- just sort of a blooming reality in our society. The, the day I walked in, best I can tell, we had 125,000 members. And I guess I became 125,001. Yeah, you know, that's the way it's worked. It's just that chain reaction from one alcoholic to another. And uh, but when I walked into that meeting, I didn't a bit more believe I was an alcoholic than a man in the moon. I didn't identify with anybody in the room. Yeah, you know, I was the youngest guy in every meeting. We were waiting on you, <laughs> <laughs> fast as we could. <laughs> I was the youngest person in every meeting I attended for years. I mean, a lot of years. Uh, when we finally got somebody in North Carolina younger than me, if he hadn't been so ugly, I'd have kissed him. I, 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 <laughs> man, I was glad to see that. You know, people have been beating on me and telling me how proud they were of me. You know, a young fellow like you, my God, that's great to see. Didn't look all that great to me. And uh, so... I remember one time a guy was patting me on the head and telling me how lucky I was, and uh, I thought my head was going to look like yours before we got through. He's patting on me. <laughs> and and uh, he said, do you know that you could actually look forward to 50 years in this program at your age? <laughs> and when he said it, he looked like that guy that hits you on the forehead you fall out. Your eyes kind of rolled back in his head. And... Uh, you could tell he was enraptured. I, I wasn't all that carried away with that. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't sure I had it, and I wasn't sure I was interested in the cure. I didn't mind getting better, but I didn't want to get good. Yeah. I, I, was, I was scared to death. Man, they're going to grab me, and they're going to have me chanting the scripture here before you know it. And so I was a little bit antsy about it. And, and so I didn't identify with anybody. I was the youngest guy in the group I went into, by, by, by long shot, most of the people in the group group had drunk more years than I was years old. 
I was 24, and there weren't any 24-year-olds that I could find anywhere that I ever went. And uh, I tell you what, when you'd oddball the crowd, that's not a, a, not a comfortable kind of a feeling. And uh, I really didn't. I mean, I'd listen to people tell their stories, and uh, I don't think we particularly lie in AA, but, you know, sometimes if you're telling a story, it doesn't come out right, you know. And, and you just gotta, you just gotta fill in a little something to make it balance out, you know. And that's not lying. That's just good, 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 uh, good, good way to make a statement. Yeah, yeah. I said, that's as good as it. Uh, but I'd listen to people tell their stories, and and it sounded so god awful to me that I couldn't. That some, some guy talked about I stayed solid, drunk, never sobered up one day for forty years. And that probably has some truth in it, but not much, not much. Been married seven times to the same woman, one year. Well, <laughs> come on now. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, folks just making a point, you know, it's got some humor in it and whatever. And it, it may even be the way they remember it, you know, if they remember like me. And uh, so I, I was listening to that kind of stuff, and, and I didn't identify it. I, I didn't believe I was an alcoholic. You know, when I first heard the notion that alcoholism was an illness or a disease, I found that a, a, an awkward, uh, almost embarrassing concept. I thought, what on earth is an illness about getting drunk? <laughs> illness is what happens after. You know, that's not what happens <laughs> during. And uh, that didn't make any sense to me. And I'd hear people giving it lofty explanations, and that meant less to me. And, and uh, I guess that's why it's so important to me what Bob said, is that we identify where we were broken and healed. You know, we identify in, in what we experienced together. It's, but I went for a long time. And then, uh, tell you, the, the one thing that, well, one of the things that kept me coming back to A was I heard just enough to keep me in the seat. And now, some of you know, not everybody here, here knows, but some of you know that, that, uh, that my first meeting was in finishing school. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it wasn't refined, but I was in school because I was finished is about what it was. <laughs> so, yeah, I was in a, in a maximum custody penitentiary, and, uh, and most of the folk in there were, were, had had a pretty radically different lifestyle than mine anyway. Yeah, I was not a criminal. Yeah, I was a. I never was a criminal. I did some things that could have been mistakenly identified as crime, <laughs> but, but they weren't really. I mean, they were. They were just sort of the survival mechanism. And when you live in places like I did, uh, you're going to do some stuff that's criminal, or else you're going to have to get out of town if you can make it. And uh, I was. Uh, I spent a good many years in. Uh, couple of our more beautiful cities in, in the United States, uh, Detroit, Michigan, which is a real stellar place. We're going to do our 20th, uh, our, our, our 20th uh, international convention in Detroit. Yeah. I happened to run into, a, well, it was hap pure happenstance. But I was at an airport, I'd been at a conference, and there was a guy from the office who worked on the international desk, you know, the one... And part of what they do is help out with the committee working on identifying sites for the next convention. And uh, Detroit, by the way, the second competition to Detroit was Vancouver, <coughs> British Columbia. If you've been both to both cities, there is no competition. <laughs> I promise you that. Now, that's a fact. And uh, so I had a good chance to, 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 to corner that boy and... I said, you, you were on the committee to pick the internationals, eh? And he said, yeah. I said, let me just ask you one question. Were you guys drinking when you picked the internationals? <laughs> <laughs> he kind of insulted it. He said, no. My God, no, we weren't drinking. I said, well, why did you do it? I mean, if you were drinking, I could understand it. <laughs> do it for, anyway, it's, it's, uh, that's where it would be in 20. I told him... I, I, that there's a good chance I might not go to that one. <laughs> I'll only be 97 years old, so it's <laughs> a good chance I may not go to that one. <laughs> if I'm here, I probably will. But anyway, that, 
Detroit is not exactly Mayberry. I mean, it's a, you, you could call it that. It's a, it tends to be the murder capital of the world. And, uh, and, you know, and Flint, Michigan was the other, the other town. It's just north of Detroit a ways. And uh, so those two cities were where I lived. My primary base was in Flint. And when I got through trying to work in polite society, uh, I just sort of scuffled around those towns. And, uh, and I basically just, it's not exactly wits. I, I think I'd, I'd, I'd survive by my lack of character. And in, in that environment, it really wasn't considered crime by the guys there. I mean, it was a matter of, it was like reciprocal trade. You know, what you get me one night, and I'll get you the next night. And that is just the way it was. That was the economy. It just worked that way. And uh, nobody ever called the police. I got it. They called the police to arrest the whole crowd. You know, it's, where are you going to put anybody worse than the streets in Flint or Detroit? Yeah, going to jail would be a promotion. <laughs> so anyway, it, it, was, uh, it, it was just, now that wasn't you know, that, I really don't consider that crime. The polite society might, but I, I do. And, uh, and I'd been in jail, God knows, uh, most of my life, in and out, just a typical drunken stuff, you know, just into jail for always lightweight, uh, social nuisance type stuff, you know, just drunk on the street or whatever, you know, or scrapping on the street or stuff like that. It had always been that kind of thing, and nothing ever serious. I'm not a criminal, I didn't steal. Now, if you happen to leave a bottle unprotected, that's, that's just carelessness. That's not, you're not a victim. You're a volunteer when you do that. But, but that's not like plotting and deliberately having premeditated intent. Yeah. I never had, yeah. You know, what, what, uh, what I was was just a guy that lived in that kind of an environment and just, just, just do what you do in that environment. And, uh, but, you know, what really, what finally brought me down was, uh, just like on the way over here, we, we, we went in the car, we saw a, a girl, I didn't see it, but uh, the other guys did, we saw some girl darting across in the traffic, and uh, one of these streets with people just buzzing in the direction, she made it, but it certainly wasn't her fault, you know, that, uh, that did but uh, I wound up in, in a situation like that. And woke up one morning in Flint, in, in, Flint, in Flint, one of my regular places, and uh, assumed I was in there for the same as always. You know, either just rock or hustling or scuffling on the street. And after I was awake a little while, I mean, it was normal for me. I knew the routine very well. Ten o'clock, the guy would come by, and he'd walk down in front of the bars, and he'd see if anybody wanted to try to make bond or get out or whatever. And so he'd walk down, and I, and I called out to him, and I said, hey, guy, when can I get out? And he just looked at me with just utter scorn and said, I hope never. He walked on. Yeah, I had no clue what he was talking about. The hell of blackouts. The hell of blackouts. And probably a good many of you have had them. You know what I'm talking about. It's a total blank. It's not memory loss. It's a total blank. And, uh, and so when he said that, I didn't know what was wrong. I knew he was serious. There was no question about that. And he walked on down the hall. And I went back into the tank, and one of the guys in there told me, uh, he said, 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 man, you know what you're in here for? And I said, no. And so he told me that the night before, some guy had been driving drunk down the main street of that city and struck and killed two people who were trying to cross the street, just like the girl on that bike was, was trying to do. But, but he was trying to cross the street and, uh, and was, was hit. And, and, and that I had been arrested for the crime. I had no clue what he's talking about. My, you know, but my mind, it's, it, it, it defends itself. Eh? And, and, and when I was given that, I, I just simply couldn't handle the information. You know, that I couldn't, I mean, I could believe it, but I just couldn't handle the information, if you know what I mean. I, and I just refused to accept that. And then gradually, gradually accepted the, 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 what seemed to be the truth. That, that apparently I had done more damage than any alcoholic ever ought to be allowed to do. And, uh, and I didn't handle that well. Even though I was a character, I'd been thrown out of the military for alcoholism when I was 20 years old. 
uh, even though I was a guy that had been just a real screwball everywhere I'd been, I was not a subhuman. I, I was not somebody who was insensitive to human life or to other people's difficulties. I was not that. And so when I was greedy with that, my, my defense was I just couldn't accept the fact. I couldn't accept what appeared to be a fact. And uh, it's the only time I'd ever been in jail, didn't try to get out. I, I didn't want out. I was, I was ashamed to get out. You know, I, I was ashamed to breathe, never, never mind getting out of jail. She was ashamed to look anybody in the eye. And, and all I wanted to do was just disappear. That's all. I didn't have any plans, no schemes, no nothing, no defense. Yeah, I'm just a, I'm just a dead man walking is what it, what it was. And I don't know why, but there was some policeman, I'll never know because I'm not going to try to find out, but there was a policeman there who apparently, I don't know, I guess he saw the shape I was in or something. And, and, and what they said was that, that, that I was confessing anything they wanted to confess to. They just said, you do that? Yeah, sure. Whatever. I mean, I was just done. So this policeman took it on himself to learn that I had family in North Carolina, made a call, told my folks what the situation was, that you've got to go up here in a lot of trouble. And if you want to do anything for him, you better come home because he's talking himself into more. Because if they'd asked me about something, I'd say, yeah, sure. Sure, I bet I did that too. And Because I was just just done. And uh, and my family did. I'd, you know, I may not say that if we had family here. No, I would too. But, but I honestly believe that families of alcoholics are punished more than alcoholics are punished. Because they have to deal with it sober. They don't have the narcotic. Of, of blacking it out and, and erasing the, the memories and realities you have to face. <clears throat> our, our family, the one has to explain unexplainable behavior and pretend it's not there. Yeah. And so my family was no different. Yeah, they, they got that word and they worked in, in a mill in North Carolina, a cotton mill, made next to nothing. It was a very low pay, pay low paying job, but they did what families have done. Uh, all, all through the years, came up to get me out of jail one more time. It wasn't their first one, but thank God it was their last one up until today. And uh, I didn't, I didn't want out of jail, but I didn't know how to say that. I mean, how do you explain to somebody you don't want out of jail? I, I just couldn't do it. And so they came up, uh, got an attorney they couldn't afford to give a defense for a guy that couldn't even defend himself, you know, and. Uh, and so they did that. They arranged me to get out on bond. And uh, when I got out, I knew I would not drink. I knew that. It had nothing to do with alcoholism. You know, when I was kicked out of the military for alcoholism at 20, that didn't mean a thing to me. I didn't a bit more think I was an alcoholic than a caveman. That, that, it, it was just a word. It didn't mean a thing to me. And so... My resolve had nothing to do with alcoholism. It had to do with just the utter guilt and shame that, that, that ate me alive 24 hours a day. I didn't think it would be possible for me to pick up another drink. I mean, how could you pick up a drink after having done something like that? The better question is how would you not pick up a drink? But I didn't know that. I didn't understand anything about alcoholism. I know that I got out, didn't know what to do with myself, walked the streets all day, all night, till about noon the next day. Got out on the 17th of July, 56, and then on the 18th of July, that next day, I started to drink. And from, from the 18th of July till the 19th of November, I drank literally like nobody I've ever seen. Now, that's not some macho Wild West story. That's a fact. I have worked with thousands of alcoholics, not a few. I've worked with thousands of alcoholics. And I'm talking about hands-on. Back in the old days when we did 12-step work, every day. Held an alcoholic in my arm while he died. And even as he died, he was protesting that he wasn't like us. And then went down. Yeah. And so I understand alcoholism, but, but the... Uh, the but I had no, absolutely no notion of any of that. I just knew that, that I just automatically just, just started to drink. And during that period, I don't think there's any question that I was trying to drink myself to death. I, I think it was just a, a polite form of suicide. That I ne never did analyze it, but I suspect that the reason I didn't just overtly commit suicide and didn't want to leave a family 
with another burden of could we have done something to prevent it. I think it's all reason. I guess I thought if I just woke up hit by a train or uh, OD or whatever, that at least there'd be a question. I, I guess that would be the twisted logic. <laughs> then on the 19th of November, I had what I hope and pray will be my last grade. Has been so far. And that's not my, it's not my sobriety date. It's the date of my last drink. And I don't know about you, but I know that I believe there is an enormous difference between my last drink and where my recovery started. It weren't even related other than the fact that if I'd have been drinking, I never would have gotten started. But otherwise, you know, that, that was not surprising. It just, I was locked up. And if I'd have been left to my own devices, I've no doubt I would have, I would have gone right back to it just as a natural reflex, but that's what it was. But that day, I finished off a bottle of gin, had probably that much in, in a bottle of gin, and I finished it off, went to court, and, and so far, that's been my last drink. I knew it was going to be the last one for a long time, because it's going to be tried that day. I was charged with manslaughter, and uh, had no defense, eh? Had, had absolutely no defense, no defense. And, and uh, so I listened to the trial as if I were on the jury. I'm listening to stuff that I've never heard before. I heard the police officer testify to what he saw, and I'd never heard that before. You know, it, like he, he said he was investigating the crime scene, and he saw this guy kind of staggering down the street that he identified as me. And... Uh, and so I listened to the, to the evidence. I listened to the witnesses. And, and, and I would have voted exactly the same way the jury did, as guilty. And, and I would have had no question about it. Yeah. The, uh, and so I, I was convicted and sentenced that day to a max of uh, 15 years, a five to 15 year sentence in the, in the state prison of southern Michigan, which was in a place called Jackson. And that's where I was when I went in to, uh, to that institution I remember the day I walked in. Walked in. Well, walked is a little bit of a, a little bit of a, 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 a little more upbeat description. I, I, was, I was led into that prison on a, on a on a chain with five other guys. And when I walked through that wall into that institution, I'd never been in a prison. I'd been in jails and stockades and pea farms and all that kind of stuff, but I'd never been in a penitentiary. I'd never even seen one to know what I was looking at. I knew they existed because a lot of my buddies went. And uh, so when I walked in, I had two thoughts in my mind. But one, just clear thought, you won't hurt anybody else. Second was that I would never come out of there alive. And both of those were very real, very real. And, uh, and, and I didn't believe you. Know, normally they didn't keep a guy, of, you know, a crime like mine certainly is, is serious crime. It's so serious that there is no adequate punishment. How do you adequately punish somebody for two human lives? You can't. You have an imbalance no matter what you do. And so there isn't any way to punish it appropriately. And, but normally, that kind of an offense, that they don't put in maximum custody. That normally is not needed because it's not predatory behavior. And, uh, and, and, and my age, you know, a 24-year-old guy, normally didn't go into that level of, of, of penitentiary. But they made an exception in my case. I think they looked at my, and mine was not a, I mean, I had a lot of arrests, but they're all lightweight things and nuisance things. And uh, it wasn't a single, everything in my, I had a three-inch thick record. Guy showed it to me. And uh, the, uh wasn't a single thing, everything in there was drunk and whatever. Uh, you name it, yeah, it's in there. And, and so he got through that thing, showed me that record, and he said, man, you've had a lot of trouble with booze. And I said, yeah. I, and, I mean, that was pretty apparent. You know. And uh, he said, I'd never heard this before. He said, we have an AA group here at the institution. I think you ought to go. Now, we were far removed from the way we tend to do it now, you know, with sort of, sort of, lassoing people and dragging them into AA and mandating and all that kind of stuff. We, we hadn't gotten that sophisticated back then. Uh, we were still just saying, man, you need to go. And, that, and that's what it, this guy said. And, and I didn't even know what he's talking about. I'd never heard of AA, had no clue what he was talking about. He didn't explain it. 
And uh, I didn't ask any questions. And, uh, finished what he had to say, and I, I, I walked out. Then a few days later, I got a little slip of paper that said you can go to your first meeting, 2nd of February, 57. And I didn't have to go. That was just a follow-up to the suggestion. You, you can go. I didn't understand until I got in the group, but they had 300 members in the group. And you had to have a chair before you could get in. It didn't, you, know, you couldn't, didn't have a standing room. With 6,300 people, that's what was locked up there. Everything's crowded, including AA. And so I understood that after I got in it. And, and so the day I went in, uh, I had no, no earthly idea what to expect. I thought it was going to be some kind of a religious hoot nanny of some sort. But I said, the only thing I never associated with, with people working with alcoholics was those. Yeah, every once in a while in jails, there'd be some clean old folks that'd come in there and they'd get into some testimonies and stuff like that and sing and cry and so forth. I'd get converted every time they came in to whatever they were selling. It didn't matter what it was. And it would probably last about 30 minutes, and then it, then it was gone. And uh, I figured it'd be something like that. But I sat down in the first meeting. Only guy I spoke to him had an officer on the door. He read my name, Ivester. Yes, sir, sit down. So I sat down. And listen to my first meeting. First thing they did was pray. Same one we do at so many of our meetings, you know, that serenity prayer. And while they were praying, I'm thinking to myself, yep, just what I thought. Man, they'll be in here in just no time, shake, rattle, and roll, and leaping and jumping, snakes, and that. God knows what all he's got. And I, I sort of braced for that. Then they opened the meeting and they started reading. Now, we didn't read much here tonight. Yeah, we didn't read hardly anything. He just made up stuff. You know, he, he didn't read a thing. And uh, he recited something. So, but we, they, they read a ton of stuff. And, and uh, that looked churchy to me. Then they introduced the speaker. That did not look churchy. And this guy got up to tell his story. And uh, now I'd heard a lot of drunks tell stories. But not their own. You know, they normally is a good one they just made up. But I, this guy had to be telling the truth. Nobody's going to make that up. I mean, my God, I could have done better than that in DTs. <laughs> that guy told that story. And I'm sitting there in the mayor and said, why is he doing this? Why on earth with a decent look? He didn't, he didn't look bad if you didn't get close. Uh, <laughs> but if you got close, he was not a handsome beast. He'd been a professional boxer. And not a good one, I don't think. He was, he was, <laughs> that, that boy was chopped up something fierce. And, so anyway, he told that story. And I sat there and made, I'd never heard that kind of stuff. I didn't identify with one sound he made. I mean, nothing. Nothing. Next week, I was back. Couldn't have told anybody why I was back. Nobody cared. They wouldn't have missed me if I hadn't been there. Nobody would have cared, including me. You know, I'm just another face in a crowd of 300 people. Yeah. What brought me back to my second meeting was the, it wasn't the story of that guy. It was the magical enthusiasm that lit up his life. He was one of the most enthusiastic people I have ever known. And uh, the day I met him, he was the delegate to the General Service Conference in New York for the state of Michigan. I thought he was a nutcase. I really did. That's it. Why, why would a guy come in there and bury himself to 300 hairy legged convicts? It makes no sense. And so, but that enthusiasm, you know, that spirit, you know, you know people just like I do. When they walk in a room, the room changes. They don't have to do anything, they just walk in and it changes. And he was that kind of guy. When he walked in, it lit up. And so that's who spoke at my first meeting and brought me back to my second. He became my first real sponsor uh, when I was about a, a, a year in the program, and I'd learned what a sponsor was. I'd had one other guy in the group that I'd, that I'd, I'd, I'd he was a good guy, you know, and I, and, and I trusted him. He was a wise fellow, he was considerably older than me. He wasn't a counselor, but he was one of the wisest counselors I ever saw in my life. He was a really good guy. He basically stuck up uh, service stations in convenient mart. It was his profession, but he was a, an excellent counselor. And so he, he and I worked together a little bit. And back then, we didn't take people through the steps like we so often do now, but didn't do that. Uh, you know, just kind of fumbled way through, and that's exactly what I did. I fumbled my way through the steps and did the actions that were laid out. I'll tell you a thing that had compelling value to me. In, in, in that setting, 
Yeah, we didn't have 300 superstars in there, just like any group, any group. There, there, there's, there's always a solid core of people who take care of business. Then you got people in all phases of development. You know, you have almost every meeting, you got people just in the starting blocks, and others like me that's old and may not make it through the meeting. <laughs> but you got some of both in there. And what the guys did in that in that in that group made some, had a value to me. They would basically do just an introductory thing of telling you what AA was. You know, nothing like a beginner's meeting of trying to get into steps or anything like. Just basically information. What's an alcoholic? What's anonymous? What's a sponsor? What's a homeowner? Just simple stuff like that. And a guy one day, another guy locked up just like me, was talking about the steps. You know how we all put them on the wall? And we had them on the wall. He pointed out, he said, there are 200 words in those steps. And if you take the action that are laid out in those steps as honestly and thoroughly as you know how to do it, when you get through, you'll be a different guy. And it doesn't even matter what your motives are. Well, that caught my attention. I said, come on, man, you gotta, you got to be kidding. you got to be straight up. You're not going to get something back if you don't put something in. I mean, I, I wrote that off. But you know the guy told the truth? It was absolutely true. Because that's what I did. I fumbled my way through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Little guidance or leadership except for that one old guy that I would just chat with some as, as we went along. But I did the actions as well as I could, as, as well as I could. And when I got through, uh, I'll tell you today more certainly than I would have then. When I got through, I was a different guy. I mean, I was still the same guy. I'm still six feet tall and ugly. You know, <laughs> that, that. But, I was a, but I was a different guy. I had a whole different outlook on life. I was a man transformed. Transformed. Simply by the actions of those steps. I was a guy that for the first time in my life, I learned to have concern for other people. Yeah, I, I never did. I mean, I may feel sorry for somebody, but in terms of having concern, taking time, investing time, trying to give support and encouragement, yeah, that was not in my, in my, uh, in my bag of tricks. But I was a guy that was I learned how to live with dignity. I didn't even know the word, but I learned how to live with dignity. To carry myself like a gentleman. To pe treat people with consideration. I learned what integrity means. And I practiced integrity. If, you told, if I told you something, you could count on it. It would be done. Those were all brand new qualities for me. I'd never known anything about it. And I'm practicing these things in an environment that defies imagination. If people talk about having to have conditions right, that's a bunch of bull. <laughs> you, know, you could not have had a worse environment to work in than the one I was working in. An environment where the predatory nature of man was omnipresent. Where the every day was filled with tension, fear, anxiety, anger, disgust. You know, every day. Where you learn how to talk with people and don't look at them. You listen but don't hear. You, 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 you've got to stay in your own cube. You know, just a bizarre way of living. And in an environment like that, this program was powerful enough to give me a new life. A brand new life. And when I got through that inventory and, and, uh, and, and did that fifth step, I remember... You know, they say we ought to be careful about doing this step, who we do it with, and all that kind of stuff. Well, there's some truth in that, but it's not exactly the gospel. It's just there's some truth in it. But you don't have to have the Sistine Chapel to do a good fifth step. I promise you that. I did mine on a prison yard in a maximum custody penitentiary with 6,330-something people wandering around, all around me. I sat down with another guy, a guy locked up just like me, on what looked like a park bench, right in the middle of all that. And I opened up to the first human being who ever had a look at who I was. And when I got through with that, I guarantee you, I was a man freed. You know, in the book, the Pete Taylor page, but in the book... 
right at the, it's at the end of that fifth step, it says, now we go back to our place and then we review these first five proposals, those first five steps. I say, how am I doing? And that's what I did. I went back. I was almost floating. I was, I was so, so relieved. When I got through that experience, that fellow knew me better than my mother knew me. Literally. Better than my mother knew me. He knew me like no other human ever had. And I was a man freed. I was absolutely freed. And went back, took a look at the first five proposals and said, well, that's about the best I can do. And it was good enough. And so I was off and running. And, and so power, power in, in those steps. That's just the first five steps. The power in that. And uh, then I moved on into, uh, we'll, get in, we'll probably get into this some more later on, but the power, you know, I'm going to share something with you before the night's over. I want to be sure that I, that I get to communicate that effectively. That, uh, I mean, people can practice it any way they want to, and do. But there's a, in fact, let, let, me, let me veer off and just share this right now. Because it's, it's where I was. Now, fortunately, I turned the right way. But I brought this along. It's a story of something, and I know that some of you that have been around a while have seen the same thing I have. Strange thing, but we have almost as many suicides in early recovery as we do in active alcoholism. And when you think about what happens if all you do is stop drinking, you can see why alcoholism is alive and well and continuing and will flat eat your lunch. I've known many people. And you know, we do it, you, you know, each one of us has got to find our own value with this thing. And nobody going to say you pass, fail. You know, it, it just, it's just a matter of what, the results speak for themselves. But an awful lot of people come in and, and try to get by with just not drinking and hanging out with other members. You know, just, just not drinking in fellowship. And that's all right for survival. But it didn't get doesn't get down to those basic causes and conditions. And uh, I'll give you one example, and then I'll share this example here. You've probably seen the same thing I have if you've been around here very long. Is that you can spot it when somebody is just just getting eaten alive. Now you may walk around joking and smoking and all this kind of stuff, but you can spot it when when it's, it's something just eating on it. And there was a guy, the example I use of one of many, guy came into my home group, and um, yeah, I kind of stationed myself so I could see the door, you know, when we were hanging out. Because I like to kind of look out for fresh meat, you know, and if I see somebody I don't know, <laughs> I'm going to cure that situation, because I'm going to go over there and, and, and handle them if they'll let me. And, uh, well, if they won't let me for a while till they break away, but... They, uh, sometimes they do. But I, I'm looking for people that look like a dead man walking. You know what I mean? I mean it, there's no, no description of that, but you spot it. You know it when you see it. And I saw this guy walk in one night, and he was a dead man walking. I knew him casually, you know, like you'll know people around just floating, floating around town. I, I knew him casually. I knew he wasn't the founder. I, I knew that. But he wasn't much of a member. You know, he was just a guy that floated and just went from one place to another. Never really sunk roots anywhere. And uh, so he came in, and so I went over. And, you know, you got to use a little sense about it. You can't just charge into everybody the same way. Some people you can go out and push them around and laugh and joke a little. But others you gotta got to sneak up on them, you know. And he was one of the latter. So I went over and just kind of kind of welcomed him and and gooshed him a little bit and and uh, bought him a cup of free coffee. <laughs> told, him, told him he could pay me back at Starbucks. <laughs> he has a jet. <laughs> but, but you see what I'm talking about. I just kind of, kind of get something going with him. Well, he's a standoffish fellow. You know, he's not somebody that's going to shake hands and say, man, great to see you. You won't do that. But he started following me. <laughs> Now, I sit on the front row. 
Because I can't hear. Yeah, I mean, that's why. I'm not all that dedicated. I just can't hear. So I sit there. Plus, I can tell if they're lying better if I'm sitting close to them. And so he, he came up and sat with me on the front row. He'd never been there. And uh, I noticed that this boy would cry it in. Oh, boy, he's 50, 60 years old. The old boy. He, he, he would cry. You could read the steps and he'd cry. Yeah. Read the purpose and he'd cry. With me, if you read the concept, I'll cry. Uh, but, but with him. And as I just was intrigued by that, you know, so he'd go with me. And, and finally he started to open up a little bit and he said, Will you show me how I can get active in this thing? I said, Yeah, sure. I said, I'm going to prison tomorrow night. Go with me. <laughs> he said, Look startled. He said, Can I go? I said, Well, I just told you. Yeah, come on, we'll go. So I took him to prison. <laughs> He's pretty, pretty well healed guy. <laughs> had a Mercedes about as long as this building. <laughs> and uh, came by, had a little Honda about the size of the fireplace over there, about, <laughs> just about that big. And he chose not to ride in mine, so I rode in his big old Mercedes. Went over to prison. We were sitting in the group, and the officer came over. They tapped me on the shoulder. I said, what is it? He said, do you have a Mercedes? I said, well, yeah, I do. And I said, why? He said, I said the lights are on. I said, well, it's not mine. Mine's home on blocks. I can't get it to run. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, it's not that one. This is a show sure enough Mercedes. He said, and uh, I said, well, it's his then. And uh, so he told him the lights are on. And I said, come on, we've got to get the lights out. He's, it's in the middle of the meeting. He said, I don't want to leave the meeting. I said, well, we're doing this in front of the guys, you know. I said, I don't want to walk home. <laughs> and he, he said, I'm not leaving. I said, yes, you are. You're getting out of here. So we're about to get into a scrap in the middle of the meeting. And it's a real example to those guys. And uh, <laughs> finally he said, I got a good battery. I said, you better hope you do. <laughs> so finally we broke it up and get, got back to AA. But that's who he was. And he, he, he got something out of that. And then he started talking to me a little bit, eh? A, a little bit, you know, and I started to understand why I was crying. And this was a guy, and his story would be repeated a million times. Eh? He, he was a guy, his family had been chaos from confusion from day one. He, he had a wife, and uh, I swear to God, if he's telling me the truth, that marriage was like the Third World War. I mean, that was a real, real deal. I didn't hear her side yet. I heard his. But anyway, it sounded rough. And uh, he had two sons. One of them had already committed suicide. And he had another that he hadn't spoken with for 25 years. See what I'm getting at? Yeah. Now, just not drinking and hanging out with a new crowd won't even touch that. Won't even touch it. It won't even reveal it. And what you do is ignore it, but it won't go away. It will eat your lunch on a regular basis. And that's the thing about amends. You know, it's about making amends, not because we're good guys, but because if we don't get rid of that stuff, we drag it forever, forever. And that's what was going on with him. <clears throat> he said, will you help me with that? I said, well, I'll try. And... Uh, he, he, he told me the situation in more detail. I said, well, let me think about it. And uh, his, his son lived way out in the west, not too closer to here than to where we were. And, uh, and I said, I'll tell you what I'm, I'm going to lay out that I think you need to do. Buy a ticket to that town, going out one day and coming back the next. Call that son and tell him you want two hours of his time. And then you make direct amends to that boy, to your son. And uh, don't get anybody else involved. Don't have a family reunion. Don't go kill a buffalo or something. You go out there, <laughs> you're a man on a mission. You go do that, get back on the plane. Well, he called me from out there. He said, I'm coming back. Well, I knew what that meant. And I said, why? He said, he doesn't want to see me. Uh, by now, I knew him a little bit. And I said, how do you know he doesn't want to see you? He said, well, I just know. 
I said, no, it doesn't work that way. You call that boy, tell him you want two hours, and you make those amends, or don't come back to North Carolina. I don't care where you go. <laughs> don't come back to this state. You know, you go somewhere else. And so he stayed. And, and that summer, the, the reunion occurred, eh? and, and that summer, that family vacationed with him in North Carolina. <coughs> First time they'd done anything family-like for 25 years. That, that's what I'm talking about, you know, that when we slide by and we think that not drinking is going to heal everything, doesn't touch it, doesn't touch it. And those things go on, and they go on, and then people wind up doing something you wouldn't expect them to do. And wind up either shooting themselves or hanging a rope or whatever, you know, but, but it, 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 it happens. And this thing here I was going to share with you, I'll, I'll slide it in now since we're just talking along that line. This, this is something a guy wrote. He was working with a fellow, just like I was working with this guy. Here's what he, what he wrote. Now, this is a little bit grim, but so is the reality. We buried him yesterday. The county coroner had published the required notices for next of kin, and nobody had claimed the body. It was just myself and his sponsor, no preacher even. The county doesn't pay for those. Not much of a send-off, and not the one David had asked for. That was the guy that, that, that died. Not the one David had asked for. A cheap coffin, a backhoe dug a hole, and that was it. Just another old AA gone. He had been sober over 20 years and first tried AA over 30 years ago. A stern and rigid man who tried to soften his edges but never could. He was a loner, a fringer, an isolated man at the edge of life's good things. He hung in there and in the end hung himself. I don't know why I can't know. I know there had been a, a, a diagnosis of senile dementia, and I know that the doctors had added cancer to the list, but I've seen AAs deal with such things before. I don't know why David decided he couldn't. It wasn't the first time I've been through that, that, this in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've known several men over the years who just, just up and walked out life's door one day, sober but not happy, sober but not at peace. Sober, but they died of alcoholism. Our disease doesn't need us to drink in order to kill us. I wish more folks knew that and appreciated it. Alcoholism is the only disease that is entirely capable of fighting back, of taking care of itself, and of emerging in new places and new forms when it isn't properly treated. That's because of the spiritual malady. Many, most people think that has something to do with prayer with God. It doesn't. It has to do with our spirit, that force which animates, motivates, and propels us. As an alcoholic, my spirit is ill, it's flawed. My character or basic nature doesn't work right. At its root, it is a fundamental and unresolvable insecurity, a hole that can never be filled. It's an instinct run rampant, a desperate need for acceptance and love that can't be met. It hurts, it fills one with fear. The selfishness and self-centeredness of the alcoholic lives here. We're totally preoccupied with what is going on with ourselves on the inside. The slings and arrows of life experience are warped by this need in ourselves and drives us to the fringe. And the voices of the committee in our head keep us there. We're obsessed both with self and from the condition of mind, the insanity of feelings gone haywire. Wire. We become self-medicators eventually. We discover alcohol or something else. And the stuff quiets the voices, provides the relief we've never been able to find in any other way. Is, is it any wonder we drink or drug the way we do? And some of us don't develop an addiction. In attempting to meet these crying demands of our spirit, we become ill. And we develop other foul more malformations of behavior and suffer in a hundred different ways. God broke David's obsession to drink, but I don't think David ever truly understood his disease. I say that because I watched him struggle with those old unresolved issues of his heart for years. His rigidity, coldness, aloofness, isolation, and difficulty with other people were a reflection of the pain in his heart, of the disease of alcoholism gone deep inside and still active. 
Alcoholism didn't need David to drink in order to continue trying to kill him. And in the end, it's, he, it, it succeeded. In the end, instead of self-abandoned, David abandoned hope and discovered a better end. Our recovery from alcoholism through the steps must be a threefold process. It's not one dimensional. When we say in A that we have a triangle, recovery, unity, and service, we mean it. In working the steps, I clear a pathway for two purposes. First, to come to into, into a group of human people and away from the fringe of society where I spend most of my emotional life. Secondly, discover belonging through service to the people within that group. It is only this entire threefold process that heals. It is especially true for those of us who suffer from the spiritual malady to a greater degree. Perhaps the 12th step says, has, says it best. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps recovery, which is recovery, we tried to carry this message to other alcoholics, which is service, and practice these principles in all our affairs, which is unity. You see, I cannot hold back. I must not continue to suffer that shyness, aloneness, that overwhelming sense of, of self in my affairs. I must get involved in a group of people to practice these principles in all my affairs. Only the total approach is healing. Anything less is little more than driving my disease deep, and if I do that, it will continue to eat away trying to destroy me. It destroyed David. This is a memorial to an old egg who gave his best shot. And I think David ended up on the plus side. It wasn't his fault. He seemed to have been born that way. There were a lot of old ideas about self that David could never muster, the willingness to let go of. He's at rest now. But it says somewhere that no matter how far down the scale we've gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. David cannot speak to his experience any longer. I'm speaking in his memory. And I think that if David could talk to us today, he'd say, understand your disease thoroughly and work the complete program of recovery. That, I, I get a lot of stuff you know, through emails you know, coming into the computer. That's the most galvanizing thing I've ever read. It's, it's particularly galvanizing for me because I've seen it so many times personally. You know, not just once or twice, but I've seen that repeatedly over the years. And, uh, and it's always a sad thing to see uh, when, when you see that go down that way. You know, I had a good friend who was a Methodist, Methodist minister. Fine guy. You know, he had a, had a nice church up in the state of Virginia and uh, was a good guy with a family, very respected in his, in his uh, community, and, and a real good guy. And... Uh, but you just never know what's going on in, on the inside. You know, that he's uh, he, he did just exactly, not exactly the same thing. He didn't take a rope. But here he was, a very successful minister in a large town. And one day he got to the point that the best thing he could think of was drive out in the woods and shoot himself. And uh, so, so, it, so it happened. My God, just 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 over and over and over. <clears throat> I'll tell you one other one. that uh, I could tell you a hundred, but I'll just tell you one other one that... Uh, I had, had watching the door one night. I saw a guy come in that I knew a little bit, and he'd never really gotten in to A. He, he visited an awful lot, but never had really gotten in, didn't belong to a group or anything like that. I'm going to start dressing. <laughs> yeah. But he, he just just one of those guys that you see around. And I saw him come in one night, and so I started over there, to catch him, you know, and, and I was just gonna, gonna, just how do you do it? Welcome him into the fold, and, and he saw me coming, and he bolted out the door. Well, I don't know. That just brought out the hunter instinct in me. So I, so I, I took off after him, and, and so, but I swear to God, the boy was fast on his feet, and uh, so I'm chasing him around the church where we met. And uh, later afterward, I thought, my God, suppose some news folks have been filming. This is the way they do it. <laughs> oh, Jesus. But same thing happened to him. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he got away and, uh, and then wound up shooting himself in front of his family. And uh, so it's just, just, it just happens, you know. We, we, a lot of times we deal with this sort of thing at the nuisance level, you know, where, yeah, guess what? Well, he's not really serious about it. He's not getting in very deep. He's not doing anything. And uh, but I tell you, those cases bring home to me very vividly 
that if I really want good, solid recovery, I have to do the things that make good, good solid recovery happen. And, uh, and so you know, what I just alluded to it a little bit. You know, when I was getting introduced to the program there and it started to work for me, I did those steps the best I know how. And, uh, and lo and behold, if, if there's ever been a human on, on the face of this planet that hates a, pr a prison worse than me, I'd like to see them because I don't think I've ever met anybody that I could see hated that kind of an existence as much as I did. I mean, I flat despised it every second that I was there. And uh, just, just the kind of environment is not supportive of anything positive or anything like that, just a predatory envir environment where man's inhumanity, man's routine behavior. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I said in my cell one night, helpless to do anything about it, and listened to a young fellow get his head beat in with a hammer over a package of cigarettes package of cigarettes and what goes behind that you know it, it, it insulted me or something you know just, just goofy stuff here and, and listen to that and you do nothing about it eh? and, and so even in that kind of an environment you know that I became literally a free man in every way that counted except physically probably the least important but I became a free man I became somebody who was functional, who cared about other people. I became a leader. I was respected in a in a an environment like that where you usually don't respect anybody that's not the toughest guy on the on the yard. I was respected because I was stood up for what I believed in, and I was trusted by people that didn't even know me. You know, just because of the the, the, the program it wasn't me. It just gave me the ability to live. And uh, I tell you the, uh, the 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 thing that. If, in case you're, you're in the fog, I don't want to give you a sales job with this, but I just want to tell you the truth of, 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 you know, of what happened with me. You know, I believe without, well, not, I don't believe, I know that this program will, will produce genuine joy, genuine joy that never ends unless you want it to end. You know, you know people ask me, well, how long you stay on a pink cloud, we call it a pink cloud or a honeymoon phase or something. People ask me how long it lasts. You know, what I'll say, because it's what I believe, is some people will tell you that it'll run a span and it'll tail off. That's just flat wrong. That is wrong. You know, it'll last as long as I do the things that make it happen. Not a minute longer, but not a minute less, because it doesn't run its course. It's a way of life. And just like this guy's talking about there, that he didn't get into the whole program. He just got into survival level at the superficial level instead of becoming a free man. And, and that's what happened at the institution. Now, I guarantee you, I never learned to like it. I, I mean, I, I, I hated the day I left. But I was a good citizen. I was a good citizen. And I'll tell you, the, the, kind, of, the, the kind of thing that can happen, this is most I'm going to talk the whole weekend now, but I'll get it done in this y'all's time. Y'all means all of you. <laughs> I mean, there may be a language barrier. <laughs> the, uh, but, but, but what happened with me, and I, you know, all I'm trying to do is do my time. You know, and and, uh, and uh, so, but I became a pretty functional guy. You know, I, I was a barber in there. And uh, it's a good job. I, mean, I wasn't very good at it, but I mean, that's right. <laughs> I was persistent. I wouldn't give up. And uh, <laughs> cut a guy's ear off one time. But <laughs> well, it wasn't a whole ear. I mean, nothing to get excited about. It was just the top of it. It was all it was. <laughs> but he took real exception to that. He, he wanted to fight and all that kind of stuff. But I'm the only guy in there that could legally have a straight razor. <laughs> he looked at that and changed his mind. He didn't want to fight. He, just, he wanted to back off and cuss. So I let him do that. But anyway, the, uh, yeah, I did that. I made it a practice. I made it a practice in the, in the group. To but I would give people their going home haircut, and you know you want to do as best you can when somebody's going home. They want to look good as they as they can, and so I'd always take a little time with them, try to get them. And when I'd get a guy in the chair, it was amazing how many times I saw this. 
I get a guy in the chair that had been active in the group, you know, that I thought would look like a pretty decent member. And I get him in the chair and, 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 and say, well, you're getting out. Hey, where are you going? Detroit. What are you going to do? Going to work at Ford, you know, or General Motors somewhere. I said, oh, okay. And I said, where you would say, where are you going to AA? And I can't tell you how many guys I've had that would just, just jump back in the chair and then look at me and say, man, you serious about this stuff? I said, you better believe I'm serious about it. Serious as a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also had the job of giving the welcome back haircut. <laughs> and, uh, I guarantee you I took time with that one. Because, I, very frankly, I learn as much from losers as I do from winners. Now, I'm kind of a cold-blooded dude that way. I mean, I will flat capitalize on losers. Because I want to learn from folks who, who teach me how not to do it. And so I get guys in the chair and they come, come back and say, I, I want you to tell me something. No junk. Tell me what happened. Why did you leave here and then turn right around and come back? And it nearly always be the same thing. Well, I meant to do something and I meant to get there. And then you've heard the story yourself. But I don't need to recite it. And then, but that taught me something. I learned a lot from losers. When, I, when it was time... Uh, yeah, I've had a lot of remarkable things happen in, in my recovery that, that really defy imagination. That I had a guy, I was not a guy, but I had, I was called in when I'd been in there about three years or so, something like that, for, for L, on a 15 year maximum sentence, the, the parole eligibility would be one fourth of the, uh, of the maximum. When I only had two years in, uh, I, I was, the parole commission, sent for me. The state parole con commissioner sent for me to come over to some office building. So I went over and uh, the chairman of the board met me at the door and he, he, uh, he introduced himself and he said, you probably wonder why you're here. And I said, <laughs> well, it had occurred to me. And uh, he said, about once every 10,000 cases, we'll pick out a case that we think is a remarkable example of, of restoration or rehabilitation or something like that. And he said, we decided to take a look at your case. And I said, well, I appreciate that. That's quite an honor. And it really is. I mean, if you want out of 10,000 cases that says this is worth taking a look. And, and he told me right away, he said, uh, but now I'll tell you up front, we're not going to probe because the crime is too serious and the uh, time served is too short. And I told him very honestly what I believed. I said, I agree with you 100%. Because e even though a crime like mine is what they call a casual offense, you can't get any more serious than two lives. And there is no adequate punishment. I mean, you, you can stay there forever or be executed over and over. There is no adequate punishment. And, but there is such a thing as a, just a reasonable, a reasonable kind of a balance in, 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 in that thing. And, and so I, I knew that it was just premature. And, and, and so, sure enough, exactly what he said, when the eligibility time came, I walked out. He told me I'd walk out that day, gate, and I did. Fully prepared to go. Went to the street. What I had was a strong program. Good thing I did. Good thing I did. Because I tell you, everything that calls itself AA and flies the flag ain't it. I, I tell you that. We got an awful lot of stuff that flies the flag that doesn't even look like AA on its worst day. And, uh, and when I got out, I'm looking forward to uh, being right in the, the heart of all the good stuff. You know, we're going to be doing it just like the General Service Office and all that. <laughs> the first meeting I went to when I got out of that institution was the worst meeting I'd ever been to. I, I'd never been to If we'd had a meeting that bad in prison, somebody would have got hurt. I mean, it was like, don't get away with that job. And, but it was going on just like it was good. And uh, the group that I was planning to go to had one member. The one that had written me a letter got, got hired back by a company, and he moved away by the time I got out. And that, the only thing left was one old man. I mean, he was old. I, I'm, I'm not talking about like us. <laughs> this was an old dude, and uh, he was the treasurer. Well, there wasn't nobody else, I'm so he was the treasurer, 
And he literally kept the money in a coffee can. And with him, his, the biggest problem with him would have been putting money in it, not taking it out. But anyway, he was the only sign of life. Great old fellow. Great old fellow. But I mean, he was pretty much over the hill. And so I hit the street, and I'm coming out of a live wire group. You know, I'm coming out of a strong group where we're hustling and moving and doing stuff. And uh, hit the street, and it looked like death and zone somewhere. I mean, good God. And my first thought was, the city is 25 miles away. The biggest city in the state was 25 miles from where I live. I said, shoot, I'm not staying here in this rinky dink Mayberry-looking thing. I'm going over to the city to get some action. Then a troubling thought occurred to me. When do you become responsible? When do you step up to the plate? When do you take some responsibility? When do you have some ownership over the lack of, of, of a good solid group? Well, the answers were obvious and troubling. <laughs> and I didn't go anywhere. I stayed right there and had a marvelous, marvelous experience of developing Alcoholics Anonymous in a town. Wonderful experience. You know, that's... You, he can tell you what page it's on. But in that, I, think it's, I believe it's 164 where he talks about, you know, the thing of when you get to town and you don't know who's there and whatever this stuff, start it. Start something. Get something going. What a marvelous experience. And I had that experience. So the, uh, I'll give you one example. Because the uh, CPC, your know, cooperation with professional community, where we, where we work with people who capture alcoholics, is basically what it is. And uh, I don't think you'd ever heard of that in that town. I didn't know what I was doing. But back then, we did an awful lot of 12-step calls, you know, where somebody get make a call for help, and then somebody go see them and work on it. That was what existed before treatment came into the world. And I got a call one night from a, a guy that he's the first kind of a high-level manager type person that I'd ever gotten hold of. And I, yeah, I learned that, that people usually made 12-step calls either because they wanted to get sober or they wanted to get away from their husband or wife so they'd get a drink. He was of the latter variety. And so I messed with him. I always made it a rule on 12-step calls that I wouldn't uh, let them drink till I was convinced I couldn't help them. And then if I got convinced I couldn't help them, I might even buy them a drink. You know, and then uh, if you can't make a sale, make a friend, eh? And so, so that's a good investment in the future. And so one night I had this call with this guy, and he was obviously uh, the one that was escaping his wife. So I rode him around, messed with him about 3 o'clock in the morning. Finally I said, where's your favorite bootlegger? I thought I knew everyone in that county. He knew one I didn't know. So he named it. We went over there, and I swear it looked like an opium den in Calcutta. It was a, I mean, you talk about a mess. Drunks laying everywhere. And there'd never been a raid in the history of that county, but they decided to have one. <laughs> so I looked out here, and here come police cars from everywhere. Surrounded that house, you'd have thought, my God, they had a riot going on. And all it is is just a bunch of crumbled up drunks on the floor. But here they came, stormtroopers charging in, and they're hauling these drunks. And I noticed one cop kept looking at me. You know, he'd, he'd cut his eyes over at me. Finally, he couldn't stand it anymore. He came over there, and he said, Mister, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, you wouldn't believe it. And he said, well, try me. And so I told him what I'm doing. He said, you're right. That's the damnedest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we visited with him. He gave me the drunk. <laughs> Didn't lock him up. Gave me the drunk. And gave me that old rock gut, whatever it was. It had never seen a liquor store. I promise you that. And I you, someone built that thing. And, and gave me that, and, and from then on gave me hell. You talk about cooperation with professional community. From then on, I, I think he wrote my name on the jailhouse wall. <laughs> if you've got a problem with one, call this guy. <laughs> call this guy. And, then, and that's how the group got started there. You know, it was just that kind of stuff, just rolling. And uh, when I left there two years later, we had 60 people in that group. That's all it takes is just one person with a little fire, a little bit of imagination, a whole lot of willingness to jump in and, and, and do the work. And stuff happens. Stuff happens. You know who the winner was. You know who the winner was. This guy right here. 
But I grew enormously from that experience. Did things that I'd never done. I had been trained to do stuff like that, you know, but, but, but I just jumped in and just followed the instincts. I got a higher power. I got a boss, a real good boss. Usually keeps me from getting in trouble. So, so really, really, really got moving. And so that's who I was. And you, you, you never know what's going to happen. When I hit the street, the only thing I wanted... I just wanted to be a citizen. I never had. Yeah, I lived in town, but I've never been a citizen. I never paid taxes, never voted. I never had any concern about anything in a neighborhood or anything like that. I wanted to do stuff like that. I wanted to vote. I, I never had voted in my life. Never paid taxes uh, if, uh, unless they took it away from me. But I never did give it to anybody. <laughs> they just take it if they wanted. And... So I want to do stuff like that. And uh, when I had been, I, I want to just tell you about a few things that, that happened. That I mean, this is not, not, not Disneyland or something, you know, where just remarkable stuff happens every day. But I really believe that, that when God has work for me to do, the way will open up. I believe, I don't believe that. I know that. I know that without any question. And if there's anything blocking, my higher power will take care of it. What I'm talking about was the, uh, when I hit the street, for obvious reasons, I had on my parole papers, this man to never operate a motor vehicle. Never. And that was fully understandable, eh? Fully understandable. And uh, I never even considered. I accepted that as a fact of life. And... When I'd only been out about two months, I'm on parole from a maximum custody facility. I'm stationed in the state of North Carolina. My parole officer came to me one day and he said, Tom, are you really active in this AA thing? And I said, yes, sir. I th and I thought he was going to say I needed to slow down. I knew I wouldn't. And he said, wouldn't it help you if you could drive? <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, but I can't, as if he didn't know. I mean, my God, he had the parole papers. And he knew what the verdict was. And he said, well, let me check it out. And he did. And then he called me just a short while later and said, can you meet me at the Sears store uptown? Now, this, this really does sound country. But you know what it is. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Sears store was where the license counter was. Not the, He didn't have an agency. They had a counter. And so I, 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 my sister drove me up. I could see my guy standing back there. I walked up to him. And uh, he introduced me to the fellow I didn't know who, who was the license examiner. And uh, so we howdied. And uh, the guy said to me that I didn't know, Mr. Logan, my pro guy, says that you might be interested in having your driver's license. And, and uh, I said, well, yes, sir, it would be helpful. And... Uh, now, don't ask me to explain it because I can't. I can't. What I do know is that my boss has a different rule book than, than what most people have. And just stuff happens, you know, that I don't need to understand it. And I'll never understand it. But the guy asked me that, and he handed me a driver's license. Didn't even ask me if I knew how to drive. <laughs> I mean, nothing. No test. No, nothing. I mean, nothing. Didn't even pay for it. <laughs> Only cost four dollars. I think could have paid that. <laughs> Ain't legal, is it? <laughs> but I've been driving ever since. <laughs> it's what I'm talking about. When God has work for me to do, I can't explain that. Any lawyer could tell you that isn't supposed to happen. But I've been driving now over fifty years with that. Not the same license. They've changed it a few times. <laughs> but an amazing thing, eh? And uh, I was, it was stuff happening. I went to a prison the second week I was out to visit an AA group. Two months later, I was a Southside sponsor. I'm trusted to be the trusted servant to give the leadership in that, in that facility. And uh, a marvelous thing. I was a DCM. You know, five months after I was out, I was DCM for my, my district and state. So things were going very well for me, and, and I was really good. And one day, I'd, I'd been out about just about two years, not quite two years, 
And I got a phone call one day, and a few of you if you are, know this. It's, it's an unbelievable story, but you can believe it. The uh, phone phone rang. I stayed at my mother's house. So I got on there, and the guy on the phone was somebody I had met once. He was one of those who came from the headquarters and would go out and visit facilities around the state. And he apparently was, a vis was visiting a facility where I sponsored the A group. And I think somebody told him to go by and give me a little encouragement. And so he came by, and we probably spoke for two minutes. And that was the guy on the phone. I remembered him. And so he told me what he said. He said, said Mr. Ivester, uh, we are expanding the rehabilitation program in our prison system, and we were wondering if you would consider accepting a position. <laughs> that still sounds ludicrous to me. It, it's still, to this day. <laughs> You know, the day of that phone call, there had never been one person on the face of this earth who had ever been employed as a professional employee in a prison system. And I knew that. I was well aware of that. And I knew they were going to start with me. But I said to the guy, number first, first thing I said was, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> and, and he said, yeah, 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 we have checked you out. Of course, I had. And I'm on parole from a maximum custody institution in the state of Michigan. And uh, well, they obviously knew that. And uh, I told them, I was good God, I'd rather do that than anything I could imagine, whatever it is. And uh, but I knew, I knew it wouldn't happen, but sure enough. You know, when God has work for us to do, walls come down. I didn't say when I want to do something. When God has work for me to do, the walls come down. I don't care what they are. They do come down. I know it. I don't believe it. I know it. And uh, so this guy told me that, and I, I thought nothing would ever happen. My state, the little old redneck state of North Carolina, I mean, we are not the liberal capital of the world. <laughs> we are not known for bold new innovations. Yet. <laughs> no. I could understand the Dominion Canada doing something like that. But North Carolina? Good God. And, but it did. And, and so I was employed as, as a rehabilitation officer. And I'm just out. I mean, my God, I've just barely got my uniform off. And I'm going to work as an official. I had to do some, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit this weekend is you know, how we fit into this world, how we fit in and make this world work around us, you know. Some of that this weekend, but here I'm walking in, in a place where where no man has ever stood, no man. It's a lonely place, eh? It's a lonely place. Uh, I had I had a sandwich one day a while back with the fellow who walked on the moon, one of the astronauts who who walked on the moon, and I was just intrigued with that. I said, Tell me about it. I wanted to hear it. So he told me about it and. Uh, it's fascinating to me to be walking where man had never walked. And I've done the same thing. Didn't think about it till afterwards. That I, my planet was a little lower than his. <laughs> so, he, uh, and by the way, uh, in, in, in talking with him, I, I, he was telling me about his ongoing projects. You know, he's still in aerospace, and he was telling me about the project. And I listened to him. I was just fascinated with uh, didn't understand it, but I was just fascinated with how much he knew. And uh, so he's telling me all about it when he got through... <laughs> He looked at me, expect you know how people do in a conversation, they look at you now, so what do you got to say? <laughs> said, what am I going to say? Well, I saw the moon come up last night. <laughs> 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 and and uh, so he looked at me, and I said, have you ever thought about using AA traditions in what you do? <laughs> well, You'd have thought I'd smacked him in the face with a wet salmon or something. You know? <laughs> he said, hey, tradition. I said, yeah. I said, now I've listened to you. I've listened to you explain in great detail that you guys know how to shoot a rocket. My God, man, you can shoot it a million miles away and make it come within two inches of where you're pointing. You know how to do that. Your problem is trying to get a team of people that can get it done without killing each other. <laughs> and he said... You know, you're right. <laughs> That's what it is. It's never the technology as much as it is the technicians that don't fit, you know. And so he said, 
Now, there's the rocket scientist said, you know, I'm going to go home and get it. I've got that book at home. I'm going to go home and take a look at that. And he says he's going to let me know how he's doing with it, but we'll find out. We, we may have the AA flag planted on the next <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, let's see, we see them in a meeting, and then you see how it fits into life. You know, in so, 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 so kind of big in many ways. And, and, and I say that because when I went to work and I'm standing where a man's in every moment, who do you talk to about problems of concern? Nobody. Nobody. you got to have somebody to share it, just like Bill and Bob. They shared the experience. Nobody to share it with. And so I had to rely on my higher power. I relied on AA traditions. I later finished up at a university in correctional administration, but that's not what, what gave me a great career. What gave me a great career are the principles I live by here. I, I went to work on the first job I was given, and I would have kept that job forever. I, I, never, I, I would have been happy to, to keep it forever. Now, you, I'm going to tell you this and, and tell you you can go to the bank on it, but it sounds unbelievable. From the day I got my first job in recovery, after I got recovered, from my first job till the last one, when I retired, I hope it's my last one, that I've never applied for one single job. I have never applied for a single job. Promotion, transfer, pay raise, nothing. Now, I'm no, I'm no Prince Charming, uh, your wonder boy in hiding. I, I'll tell you why I think that career has been like that for me. For some reason, I think AA principles guide me to give my very best of what I do. And so that's what I did. I treated every job I had as if it were the most important job on earth. He gave it my best. Because that's what tells you who I am. If what I do is sloppy work where I just got to get by instead of get quality work done, that's who I am. And so what I did was give my, every job I had my, my very best. And if somebody, I guess, somebody just be kind of watching. You know, I know I've hired hundreds and hundreds of people. And I hire people who want to do something. I hire people who want to work in behalf of an organization. You let somebody tell me how dissatisfied they were with their last job, I'm going to be hard-pressed to hire them. But I don't want to hire sore heads. My God, you can produce enough of those. You don't need to hunt more. So, But that's what I did. I just gave my best to every job. Never applied for a different one and went to the top of my profession. Now, my profession was the most unlikely one you could imagine. I'm going into corrections. Can, can you imagine a guy sitting in a cell in a penitentiary and he's thinking about what he's going to do if he ever gets out? You know, I think I'll go into corrections. I'll, just, <laughs> I'll show them how to do this stuff, man. I'm going to be a warden. <laughs> it put a net on me. I mean, they would flat put a net on me. And... Uh, but that's exactly what happened. I, I went into corrections. I started working. Then I got recruited into supervision, management, to directing some programs, and then finally warden of a prison. And, uh, and several. You know, I was warden of several prisons. And so it's a weird place to be. Yeah, but the program prepared me for it. Better than anything I'd ever done. And so I had an absolutely great career. A great career. And uh, put in 39 years. Found out I was the oldest rat in the barn. I said, shoot, man, this time. I also learned they'd pay me about as much to not work as they didn't work. And I said, hey, man, I'm going to take that and go play. So that's what I'm doing. Here. <laughs> that's why I'm here tonight. <laughs> so anyway, it, it's just, a, I, I tell you that, because every recovery doesn't end with a noose around you. Yeah, now I've still got time to do that, but I don't have any plans, no, any, any, any concerns that that's going to happen. Yeah, I've been given a life that's truly beyond anything I could imagine. Married that little girl from Saskatchewan a little over 42 years ago. And she still, she doesn't speak very good English, but she still, <laughs> she's, we've got to speak in Southern a little bit. And, uh, and we have a couple of little Canicans, uh, <laughs> Canadian Americans. And, uh, Life's pretty good. Uh, the kids have done well. The daughter's a psych graduate, and she'll get back to this planet in time. And psych majors will do that to you. And, and my son is a physician. He's a, he specializes in high-risk maternal fetal medicine. 
He deals only with cases that other doctors have got too much sense to deal with. <laughs> so they turn them over to him and let him take all the risk. I told him, boy, you better get a law degree to go with that. <laughs> and uh, he's leaving next week to go over. He does uh, he does service work in, in his field. You know, he just wants to do something where he gets the payoff that nobody can buy. And uh, so he goes over to Africa. And for the last few years, he's been going over to Ghana for a couple of weeks every two years, and he's trying to hand, trying to help young Ghanaian physicians learn how to move into the high-risk category. Great work. <laughs> Great work. Well, you, you, obviously, I'm, you know, I'm very proud of those boys. I'm that boy and that girl. They, they're fine kids. Well, they're old folks now. You know, they're giving me grandchildren, so there's hope for them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so... I guess the point is, guys. I just thought I'd spend a little little time tonight just just just, just talking about this, this just this one case, but it's anybody's case, you know. And, and so what I did was give a broken and wasted life to this simple program, and this given me back a life that literally is beyond my wildest dreams. I could not imagine, drunk or sober, thinking of a life like I've had. It's been absolutely great, and it's just started. Man, I, I've got a lot to do. I got have people tell me all the time I need to slow down. And every time they tell me they're going to slow down, I look them over and say, if I slow down, will I get like you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I said a little earlier is true. It's not party line, but it's certainly true in my view. This, this, this honeymoon or whatever you want to call it, this thing of of the fourth dimension is what we call it in the group, this fourth dimension of recovery, where we start operating on the spiritual rather than the material. That That is absolutely available. All i got to do is do the things that bring it alive. So I'm looking forward to... Oh, and by the way, just real quick before we close here, we've gone a long time for a short session. <laughs> the, uh, before we do... Uh, let's just take just a few minutes and then anybody that's got a particular area that you'd like to see us just as a group get into and, and spend some time on while we got it out of the traffic without the horn blowing and hopefully no phones are ringing much. Anybody, anything that you'd like to touch that, uh, touch on for sure? Yeah. Yeah. Um, people's experience with and how to do the steps with newcomers. Uh -huh. uh, okay. I found that there's a lack in it and when we started doing step groups in my area, everybody left. Like, you know, thank God they can send their sponsees to a step group. And maybe that's the way to do it. I don't know how it was done in the past, how it's, how people <coughs> people's experience in it. How to get people to do those steps. That's a good point. Which I wish I had yeah. done right away. Sure. You know. at, a min, at a minimum, we could get some good examples of that yeah. in here. That, yeah, so that, you know, like, just like I said, you know, I've come on my way through. There's no perfect way to do it, obviously. But if you do what's laid out in those steps, but it sure helps to be accountable to some other people. So, yeah, that's very good. Yeah, we'll make a point of that thing. That, uh, is anybody going to write this down? <laughs> it's I don't trust me. I, it's recorded. Well, well, yeah, well, nobody listens to that. I got <laughs> five, five, you, you I have one. Can take one out, so. He's the yeah. president. He, has very president. <laughs> he told me he was in charge of everything. <laughs> Any other? Relationships. Relationships in recovery. Oh, thank you. For what you're in a relationship with another person that's in recovery. That person has a little more hope to experience strength and hope than the person that you're in a relationship with. How about if we deal with just the person, the principle of, 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 of uh, relationship, the unity in relationships? Yeah, it's awfully important. You don't want to make it too specific because it rule out as much as it rules in. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, just uh, that. Yeah. Right here. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, uh, maybe if we could touch on uh, uh, Tradition 10 and to, uh, to see exactly how uh, the organizational uh, completeness between the steps really amalgamated. Yeah. Uh, uh, more fully, and, and, and as you said, with the personal relationship, how does that really, how can we be more effective? Right, can you explain to you? Yeah, the tradition is very much what, what this whole bit is about, unity and relationships is about, no matter what kind it is. Yeah, yeah good deal. Thanks. That's the tradition, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, 
Amen. 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 Well, you know, that couple of examples I gave you good. What I tell you, those will flat eat you alive. Yeah, and I honestly believe that you're never free till you deal with it. Yeah, great. Right. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll flatten it. Yeah. You got one I've heard you speak for telling the structure of your group. You know what's happening maybe three months in advance when you set up your group meetings. Because most meetings I go to, like nothing, nobody knows anything until who's going to talk. You know? and, and I think you said you set up yeah. well about that. But cover that a little bit. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, it's structure, right? Right. the structured group. Yeah. Well, that whole thing we're talking about on this not drinking, going to meetings, just hanging by the fellowship, that, that whole thing. What produced the guy with the rope around his neck? Yeah. yeah, great. We'll do it right here. Uh, just uh, something uh, about uh, getting through the dark moments in recovery. About what now? Getting through the dark moments in recovery, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the black clouds and everything. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. how to you know, just stay in the chair. And, like, I, know, I hear all the sayings and everything, but uh, I know like a few days. I know exactly what you're talking about. I have gone through those dark caverns. <laughs> so I know what you're talking about for sure. Yeah, I uh, Just one more thing on newcomers. That, um, your experience with the, the pace that you would take your guys through the 12 steps. Because uh, I mean, I've had experience short versus long. And just from your experience, mm-hmm. you find it, you kind of pace it up over the course of one. You know, you're basically doing it. There's a thing that's going on right now that's... Uh, quite localized. It's like over eight days of taking guys from staff, which I think is fantastic. But then there's also groups that are more three months and mm-hmm. just trying to get a gauge from where yeah. experience. Yeah, good point. Yeah, how we deal with our new people has a lot to do with our future. Whoops, excuse me there. Yeah, Sorry okay, about that. Tommy. Yeah, great. You, you got that one, huh? Yeah, right here. Um, how do you uh, keep it interesting all the time? You know, it's, it's great. The newcomer is obviously the most important person in the room that for people that are here longer. You know, I see a lot of people leave AA after they've been sober for a long time. Yeah. Or, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Yeah. <coughs> Maintaining the interest over time. Yeah. I, I sure agree the newcomer is the most important person in the room, unless I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I'm a, I'm a real sweetheart. <laughs> yeah. 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 When you were talking about, right, you know, taking people through the steps and they did, because you've been around for a while, right? And, like, I hear people say that they've been sponsored by a downline of Dr. Bob and all, right? And, and then when they finish, you know, the eight day process, they stand up at the podium and they talk about, I'm a recovered alcoholic. About that statement. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, do we fully recover or is it when we are throwing dirt on our grave? Mm-hmm. We'll visit recover. that neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> we will visit. Yeah. We will. Good neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chris, you know. I don't even know how to, how to phrase this, but uh, some providing some hope or renewed direction for chronic relapsers. We have uh, a lot of people that are close to us. They all, almost seem like they're cross thread. They come in, they spend a couple of weeks, they go out, they come back, they have this big feeling of guilt and shame when they, <coughs> when they announce that at the meeting. Uh, it'll seem like they're going to get it, and then they're back out again. Some of these folks are, are with us for five, ten years, and, and we really feel powerless on how to, how to help them to, to get what we've got. And it's almost like some of them are just examples that, you know, there's no human power, or, or some of us don't care for something. We can I hope everybody understood what Chris was saying here. He was talking about the perennial slipper, the guys, the guys that just come in over and over and over, retread and riding the same dead horse, you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, be giving some thought to that because there would be a lot, of, a lot of different ideas on something like that. One more. Yeah, one more to make the knees and dozen. I got one. The evolution of the idea of outside issues and alcohol is What's an outside issue? I mean, I'm how should we be talking about other side issues? Yeah. Okay. Quite a list. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think we got a great start here, Tony.
Yeah. We should, looks like we should finish this about Tuesday, I think. <laughs> 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 I think at this point, thank you, Tommy. I think we'll uh, close the meeting with the celebrity prayer.